with uh, uh, Daniel Franza, who was visiting us right before I went there. So most of you may know him. Um, okay, so for the ideas, nobody is surprised if I tell you that I've been working on quantum channels, on particular the added contraction of quantum channels. Okay, so I will tell you now what this means. For now, basically, just um, so to have an idea, the contraction of a, of a quantum channel is a way that you have to measure the, the impact in terms of noise that this quantum channel has on our uh, quantum system. So if it is a quantum processor, the contraction of the quantum channel measures how the, the quantum channels as a noise uh, model affects the computation that we are doing. So um, uh, the thing is that there is like a lot of literature on uh, some, uh, some, yeah, some measures of this contraction, uh, but we wanted to see another approach to the RH uh, strategy thing. So I know everything ready in the paper. Okay. So okay, let's start with the basic stuff. So a quantum channel is like a process that takes a quantum system, a quantum states, and gives you like new quantum states. Okay, so uh, yes, so let's say this is the input, and here you get some output state. Um, so contraction is about how, how the, the channel affects the, the states in terms of uh, distinguishability between each other. So I already talked about this uh, some time ago. So let's say we, w we have a system that is prepared uh, on a state sigma or rho, and we want to know by making measurements which of these two states was prepared, OK? So the maximum probability with which you can distinguish between these two is given by this is a 1, uh, 1 plus the one norm or the trace distance between these two. So this, uh, this thing here is a norm of this difference, which basically adds up the absolute value of the AM values of this thing. Okay, so what uh, to D. I mentioned, okay? So basically what you need to do to compute this difference between the two states is you get the spectrum of this difference. So the larger the values in that spectrum, the more different the two states are and the smaller the values in the spectrum, the smaller they are, the, the smaller the difference between these two states. Basically you, you add up all of them with an absolute value here because these things can be negative and positive. And if you add them up with the absolute value, you always get zero, so you want the absolute value there. And the funny thing of this norm or this distance measure is that is completely is directly related with the ability to distinguish the two states uh, after state preparation. Okay. So one thing that quantum channels um, have is that they cannot increase the distinguishability of the two states. So if, let's say, one person prepares the, uh, the state rho or sigma in uh, the, the system in a state sigma or rho, then another person applies a quantum channel and a third person tries to guess which of the two states was prepared originally, that task will be more difficult than doing it before applying the channel. So here, the states should be, should be more distinguishable than after applying the channel, because after applying the channel, you have introduced noise, so you have less ability to distinguish them. So this concept is the uh, data processing inequality, which basically says that if you have some uh, way of uh, measuring the distinguishability between two states, you can think here that we have this trace distance or the, this norm. Uh, this thing has to always decrease under the action of a quantum channel. So for instance, this implies that <coughs> this has to increase, decrease. Okay. 
So, so far so good. This is telling us that a quantum channel has to introduce noise always. And the nice thing here is that sometimes you have a strong data processing inequality, which means that you can find some uh, gamma value, which is strictly smaller than one and greater or equal to zero, uh, such that this is also true for, for some channels, okay? So for some channels, you can find a gamma that, uh, that satisfies this, which means like it's an upper bound on how noisy the, the state, ha the, the channel has to be. So this, the fact that we sometimes have this strong data processing inequality motivates the definition of, um, of uh, this, uh, oh, I will call it soup uh, of T, which is the supremum. And now I will focus on the trace distance of this. <coughs> Yeah, I really prefer a blackboard. Okay, <laughs> so uh, for these two different. <sighs> yeah. Okay. Ah! <laughs> okay. So <laughs> let me explain this. Uh, okay. So if our channel satisfies some strong data processing inequality, which means that there is a gamma that is strictly smaller than one such that this is true, then this object has to be smaller than this gamma. Okay? And the minimum gamma satisfying this will be this value. Okay? So the smaller the gamma, the more contractive our channel is. Because this, it means that after applying the channel, states are more near to each other than initially. Okay? Uh, don't question, so uh, we're talking about this in, in simple, from in, uh, in simple. Uh, do you mean an ensemble of states? Or? Yeah, yeah, ensemble of states. You can think of them as an ensemble of states, but I'm thinking of any, any, any two states that you could have. So this okay. supremum or this maximization is over any two possible states. So the, the nice thing about that is that that's a very strong property of the channel. The bad thing is that it's very difficult to compute sometimes. Okay. Yes. 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 So if, yes. Um, when do you have this control? Uh, yeah. Is that a question? Depends on the channel. I don't really know when you have that or not. Yeah. But yeah, I don't really know. Uh, we can have a look if you want. But there are channels, but it's quite tricky because there are channels that if you apply the, them an infinite number of times, you always go to some fixed point. So in some sense, the channel is always like carrying any initial state to a final fixed point. So it's eventually completely contractive because all the states go to the same value. But in the first step, this strong data processing constant, it's exactly one. So like in the first step is not contractive at all. It could also be that in the second step is also not contractive in this sense, but eventually it's contractive. It's a bit strange. But yes, that's a bit tricky. Yeah, as, as here we are, com we are uh, working with any ensemble and any pair of states, it's a property that only depends on the channel. Okay, and the second property is for all the strong contractive channels. Or if you get the uh, position, always this, always this, the other uh, mm -hmm. You can always define this constant, and it will always be between zero and one. But it, it, it will all only be strictly smaller than one if your channel obeys a strong data processing inequality. If it is just a data processing inequality, which is the case where uh, this gamma goes to one, then here you get a one. So this thing is between uh, zero and one, and it's strictly smaller than gamma if you have some gamma satisfying this. Okay, so uh, the thing is that there is a lot of literature uh, for this um, 
for this uh, magnitude. And I, am, I will only focus on this talk in the one norm, but there are many other ways of measuring distinguishability between different states. And traditionally, the, like there is a lot of, so you have for each of these measures, you, ha, you can define another uh, different constant that depends on the way you are measuring the distinguishability between states. And then this parameter can change, but you can relate one of them with the other and you can do like many fancy stuff. And thanks to doing these things, you can say a lot of things of this because some ways of measuring distinguishability are nice are nicer for some things and the other ones for other things, so it's kind of that way. But the issue here is that you can have a channel that is like very noisy, but it still has a data processing inequality that is equal to one. So for instance, if you have, uh, so for instance, if you have like a, the polarizing channel that takes um, some state. Wow. A, B, B bar, and one minus A, okay? And you do like a completely defacing channel to this, so you have a quantum state initially, but you end up with a completely classical state. Yeah, but the issue is that with the whiteboard, I think I won't have like enough space. Yeah, okay, but you get the idea here, right? The, the issue is that if I take <coughs> rho to be one, zero, 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 okay, and sigma to be zero, 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 one, if I take these two states, these two states are eventually equally distinguishable because I can perfectly distinguish between the zero and the one state with a single measurement. Okay? Yes? So the distance between these two won't change after the channel. So this means that this constant will be exactly equal to one. Okay? But you are losing a lot of information in the phases. Yes? For instance. Uh, and this is even more remarkable when you have like larger dimensions where you preserve the information in the diagonal but you lose all the, co all the coherences. In those cases, you are losing a lot of information in the coherences in these uh, off diagonal terms, but still this constant will be equal to one because you can always find two states that are not changed by the, by the, um, by the channel, okay? So this is one of the problems that we wanted to address. Okay, let's see if we, instead of computing like the, um, the maximum over all of this, why don't we do like an average? We compute the expectation value for any rho and sigma of this thing. Okay, so if you think of this expectation value in the block sphere, it's just you are picking like any point, any two points within the block sphere and computing their original distance and their the resulting distance. And that's what, how you do. And if you go to larger dimensions, you just have other mathematical tools that can be used to compute these things. The issue is that we cannot compute these things with the one norm, okay? We can only compute these things with the two norm because of math. So, <laughs> our, uh, so the idea is that for these cases, like with this the, the, the facing channel where you lose information in the off diagonals, this thing, as you increase the dimension, will tend to be smaller and smaller, decreasing with the dimension because the larger the dimension, the more information you are losing in the, in the off diagonal terms. But uh, this maximum parameter, this maximum thing, will will always be one. Okay, so we believe that this can, this kind of magnitude can be used to describe the noise in a more like a typical way. So the typical way the noise will affect a state that you have instead of the best case scenario uh, where the noise does nothing to your state. Okay, so let me see the time. Okay.
So I won't go into details, but as I'm telling you, uh, we are not able to compute this thing for the one norm, but we can do this kind of averages uh, for the two norm because are somehow easier. And we, so we obtain a bound for this value, which is, So this is smaller than some alpha that this doesn't depend not de doesn't depend on the channel uh, so this is some constant okay does not depend on the channel or in the dimension or some or any other thing and then we have this uh, so it's <coughs> d d squared minus one I am I'm going to okay I, I agree with it. Okay so this thing is so I call it no way <laughs> Okay so no uh, <laughs> uh, That's So so yeah so this is a uh, tau okay and this is the Choi matrix of the state, which is Choi, well, the Choi state of the state of the channel, which is this thing. Okay, so I will go through this now. So, so this is a tau squared, and this is a p squared, okay? And the p is just the image of the maximally mixed state under the quantum channel. So I take the maximally mixed state, I apply the channel, and then I compute the purity of that state. So I do this state squared and then the trace. And this gives me a value. So this is the purity because if, if the state this pi is pure, then the purity is one, because if it is pure, the square of the state is the same state, and then when I compute the trace, you get one. Okay, this is something that we see in, and so trace of rho squared, this is always smaller than one, and it's only equal to one if rho is pure, right? It's, it's for some, for some C. Super yes. Uh, you can in a yes. Okay, okay. Yes. Uh, so take that. Your, imagine that your channel is a replacer channel. So anything that you take, it dumps to the zero state. Ah, okay. That's a pure. It's a pure state, but it's, dest it's destroying all the information. But it's pure. Okay. So ah, fine. <laughs> so here you can get uh, zero if you if you no zero no. You can get. 1 over d, which is the smaller value for the purity that you can have, which is the value for the maximally mixed state. So if the maximally mixed state is untouched under the channel, it's preserved, then uh, this thing will still will be 1 over d. And if the channel transforms the maximally mixed state into something pure, then uh, you get 1 here. And this is the Choi state. So for those of you that you know, you are lucky. For those of you that you don't know, let's see if I can explain it. So the Choi state of the um, of the channel, you obtain it by you first you um, like duplicate the the system size. So this is like the original system where you apply the channel t, and here you do nothing. Okay. So in here you input like the maximally entangle the state, which is this omega. So you have two sides, maximal entangle. 
In one of the sites, now you apply the, your quantum channel, and in the other one, you do nothing. Okay? So the entanglement between these two has to be preserved or decreased because you are applying a local channel somewhere, right? So this is you're applying the channel or you are doing identity. This is basically what you are doing here. So if the, um, let's say, if the purity, it is originally pure because it's a maximally entangled state. If part of the entanglement is lost, then this will be translated into some mixedness in this state. So the more mixed the output of these, the, the, the Choi matrix, which is the output of this process, is the more, the more mix, the mixed, more, yeah, well. <laughs> If it is very mixed, that means that it, there has been like information in the entanglement that has been lost. And if it is very pure, this means that the purity of the Choi matrix has been preserved, then probably this, chan this channel that you applied is not very noisy. In fact, uh, you can show uh, that the, the purity of this thing, so this thing is pure only if your channel is a unitary channel. No noise. And it's maximally mixed if your channel is a... Uh, complete a uh, replacer channel. So if you take your initial state, your initially entangled state, you destroy this information, then you have here the maximally mixed state and replace it with uh, whatever, this will be very mixed. So this is the idea. The idea is that somehow there is like a trade-off between these two purities that is telling you on average how much your channel will uh, contract. So this is kind of the, like the, the main result that we have obtained. Uh, so trying to prove this inequality properly was like the difficult part. And um, then there are like a couple of, of things that are nice to see here. So mainly let's go first through the example. So what happens if we have a unitary channel? So if T of rho is some unitary conjugation, then uh, the unitaries preserve the maximally mixed state, so this P state is the, the maximally mixed state still. So the purity of this... I don't really understand why it does this way. It's okay. The purity of this is 1 over D, which is the minimum value. But as I told you, the purity of the Choi matrix so I, I am not computing the choice matrix now, but the purity of the choice matrix is preserved because you are applying a unitary channel. So as it is initially pure, it will eventually be also pure. So the, this purity is one. If you introduce these two values here, you get uh, the same thing as you have here below. So you introduce this D. So here you have D squared minus one. And here you have D squared minus one. So if you divide, you get a one, which means that on average, a unitary channel is not contracting at all, which it's what we would expect. On average, a unitary channel doesn't make you lose information, so it's not contracting. Good. But if we have a replacer channel that takes any input state rho and replace it with the identity, let's say. Okay, it could be anything, but we will take the identity. Then, in this case, we still have that the purity of, the, of this image is 1 over D of P, and the purity of the Choi matrix, in this case, is 1 over D squared. Why is this? Because, uh, so you have the maximal entangled state, you discarded one of the systems because you are, you are going to replace it, then you, you have an identity, a maximally mixed state in the other side, and now you put a maximally mixed state in the other side. So, you have two maximally mixed states, so everything is a maximally mixed state. And the purity of a maximally mixed state is one over the dimension. And in this case, the dimension is the twice the original dimension, so you have d squared. And if you introduce these things there, so this one is one over d squared. So here you get one over d, and the other one was already one over d. So one over d minus one over d, you get a zero. So on average, a replacer channel is completely contractive, which is what we would expect. So this is already good. <laughs> okay, but we have a nicer example, which is what, what happens if you have a depolarizing channel. So if your channel is, uh, you take your state and with probability one over P, you replace it. 
Okay, so here you can think of in a qubit channel, this would just be a two. So you take your state, and with some probability, you destroy the information that is there. So if you compute the, the same things that we had above, this theta parameter, which is this thing inside the square, is 1 over p squared. Okay, so what we get is that on average, uh, the, um, the polarizing channel is, con is uh, contracting one minus with one minus p, which makes sense because the, the larger the p, the stronger the, the, the noise. But the funny thing is that, so, so the purity of this p squared is one over p. And the one of the two matrix is something a bit more crazy, I think. So see this one minus p squared plus p over d squared two minus p. I'm sorry for this, but <laughs> the idea is that we can compute these things, and this is nice. But the one of the results that I'm more happy that we were able to obtain is that now if, if you apply, so this would be like in a single qubit, you will have this thing with d equal to two. So what happens if we have now a depolarizing channel in n qubits? So you have uh, the tensor product of all of these possibilities. Okay, so you have here d to d of the depolarizing. And so what's the nice thing of this is that the purity of this object, so if you have n tensor products of this thing, this is just the purity of the first state to the n. And the same happens with the Choi matrix. So the thing is that this formula is very well suited for, for, ten, for channels that are tensor products of smaller channels. Because these two purities can be computed by the purities of, for, the, for the first channel just to the power of n. So this allows us to compute like the theta of d to the n, which will be for, this is for large n, it will be more or less 1 minus p dn. Two, two. I'm not going to write it. So here we see that this is exponentially decreasing with the number of n's. So this is n. Uh, so the more the more qubits that you are acting on, the more the noisier your your channel becomes on average. And this may seem quite reasonable, uh, but the issue is that um, what happens if we study the this supremum thing? The, one, the, the, the best case scenario when you are replicating a lot of uh, times the, the same depolarizing channel. So we can prove that this tends to 1 as n goes to infinity. And why? Because if you take uh, the same state in all of the, let's say, row is to the n, and sigma is to the end such that these two things are orthogonal. Okay? And I'm going to explain this with the, the, the instrumental or the operational interpretation. Okay? 
So originally, before applying the channel, these two things are perfectly distinguishable because as they are orthogonal, I can measure every qubit and they will be different in every of the qubits. Okay? But then when I apply the channel, they will no longer be exactly orthogonal after the channel, but the thing is that they will they won't be the same state after applying the channel. They are a bit different still because they were originally orthogonal. So what are the chances that you get in every qubit an error? That's the thing, because if you don't get an error in one of the qubits, you're, you are already able to distinguish between these two. Okay, so the chances that you get an error in every of the qubits, that decreases with n, it doesn't increase. Okay, so if you have only one qubit and you try to do this, this supremum won't be one. It will be smaller than one because you, as if you get an error in that qubit, you lose information and you won't be able to distinguish. But now if you have two qubits and you send the two, uh, two copies of the state, you will be in, as you have more redundancy, you will be able to distinguish them better. And that only increases as you increase the, the number of qubits that you have. So the uh, shocking idea here is that you have a channel that tends towards uh, having like no contraction if you look at the best case scenario, which is taking two states that are maximally orthogonal and replicate them. But in this other, in this other case, you get that on average, this channel is getting noisier. So the extreme, <laughs> the, <laughs> so what you see is that in this best case scenario, you are getting better, but on the average case, you are, get, you are getting exponentially worse. Yes? Uh, yeah, uh, in this case, so I am assuming that you have, so this is like you have a lot of qubits, uh, or qubits, or qubits, if you want, and they are orthogonal, and they are the same state in each of these. So rho is uh, phi, like n times, and sigma is uh, psi, n times, and they are orthogonal in each of the sites. So as, as you increase the number of sites, they, they are more and more orthogonal. I mean, they are equally orthogonal, but it's, yes. So this is one of the main things that we found that we find quite motivating to follow this path. And it's that we have an example where this thing describes an exponential de uh, um, decrease in the contraction. And this thing tends like in an opposite way. So the question is, so which one of, which of these two is more relevant to describe the noise in a quantum computer? So it depends. <laughs> uh, yeah, we are trying to see if we are able to compute this. Uh, so this is more or less is like the result and like the outlook for this project would be now to, to try to obtain this kind of bounds, not only for the trace distance, but for also other ways of measuring distances between states, because they are quite useful in other scenarios, but also to try to compute this average, this expectation value under other ensembles of states. So this could be only over pure states or states with some purity or states with some given rank or something like that. And I think that that's a very interesting way to proceed because right now we are taking like weighting all states equally, even those that are super noisy, but you don't expect to have super noisy states on a quantum computer, on a device that is expected to work in the quantum regime, right? So maybe it's more interesting to try to compute this average value over other distributions of channels, and that would be like the way to follow. But still, while well, well, I'm motivated with these results and, and others, because for the, um, for the defacing, which was the original example that I also introduced, you also get this thing that with the dimension you get worse, while this supremum case, it's always one. So yeah, so this would be it. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, <laughs> So, is there any question? Do you have any hope that this thing you found is the, is the, like the real value, not just a bond? Yeah, yeah, you mean? Yeah, yeah. it's an equal. Yeah, it's an equal for many, many cases. 
Yeah. Yes, for the polarizing case, for instance, it's, it's an equal, even when you go to L, very, very large, and for almost all of the cases that I have tried, even, uh, it's, it's quite equal. So our idea, or so far, what I've found is that any unital channel that I have tried, so unital channels are those that don't change the purity of the maximum emission state. So if you introduce a maximal emission state to this channel, it outputs a maximal emission state. This means like it's not biased. So what we have seen so far is that for all of the non-biased channels that I have tried, this is very approximated to be an equal. So we have an intuition that those channels have something that we can work on to simplify this thing. How do you have a case in which it doesn't work? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, it, it makes sense that it doesn't work because this, these things with the norms, so this is, this in the end is like an inequality between norms, which has like a typical value, but the extreme value goes with the dimension. So they are typically similar, but in the extreme cases, you can always find like extreme examples. Extreme examples. Yes. So, any other question? Um, have you? Yeah. Uh, have you found any connection between like uh, communication mm -hmm. and something like this? Because this looks like typical bounds that you get when you try to communicate some information through a noisy channel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe because of the interpretation in terms of communication, this bound has been like very, very uh, strongly studied in the literature because in communication you are usually allowed to decide which input state you have, right? So if you, have, if you can decide which input state to use, you will use those ones that suffer less from the noise. So that's why you are definitely completely disciplined. So what's the best I can do with this channel, right? Um, then you have also the, these capacity things, which are similar, but not the same. Uh, but in this case, uh, it would have to do with communication, but only if you kind of assume that you are not really uh, able to decide what states to use, or you don't really know the bias of the channel, but you somehow know that it has some description, maybe. But I think this, this is more useful in the case of computation, where you are assuming not to know the, the state of your computer, or your sensor, or whatever, because if you knew it, then, then you don't need the computer to do it, right? So maybe it makes more sense in that other scenario. Yeah. Okay. I, I guess that it's quite difficult to compute, but would it make sense here to be able to compute the variance of the order? Of what? Of the, the I don't know, the, the average. Of this thing. Yeah. Like yes, so, so originally, what, uh, so this is a bit more mathematical, so if I was explaining this to a completely mathematical audience, I would have said that our definition is, here we have like, we are computing like the big moments of this thing. So this is an interesting thing because here, if you compute like kind of these p moments and you do p to infinity, you get the supremum. And if you get do p to minus infinity, you get the infimum. And if you do p equals to zero, you get the median value. And if you do p equals to one, you get the mean value. So mathematically, this thing is super interesting, but it's completely, it's very complicated to compute. And not only that, if your dimension increases, like if you have like yeah, already for uh, ten qubits, this value is. I mean, it's concentrated, I mean, super crazy concentrated. So it's almost the same contraction for all of the states. As, as you increase the dimension, the value for the average contraction, it's the typical contraction, by like exponential, about some exponential concentration uh, result. Is it for the distribution or, I mean, if you consider another distribution that you are Yes, if you consider another the distribution, that can change. Yes. Uh, but this doesn't depend on the purity of the distribution. So for any distribution that is, let's say, unital invariant in the whole system, uh, so no matter whether you are taking pure states or mixed states, the value, the particular value may change, but it will be typically constant over the whole set. So an example where this could not be true is if you take all these separable states. So let's say we are now interested in computing this kind of Averages for this case, 
but we are only using separable states for the for the average for this expectation value. And I don't know what would happen there. It's also an interesting case, but those cases will be the ones to, I expect not to have a concentration. Yes. Yes. And does the reason that your report to write an inequality with an inequality have to do with the fact that we don't know how close the input states are to fixed points in the channel? You were here? Yeah, I mean, we, are, we don't know uh, what rho and sigma are initially, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the deal. So it could be close to fixed points on the channel or not. Is that sort of why we need to write an equality instead of something in the exact? Mm, yeah, uh, not exactly. So the so there are like uh, three steps in this inequality, and in the first one, it is inequality an inequality between the one norm and the two norm, and that's forced because uh, yeah, no matter yeah, uh, even if these two states are very very similar the distance in the one norm and in the two norm could be exponentially different. In the sense that uh, you have like a dimensionality factor between these two. So you get a dimensionality factor, but then with another inequality that we have, we remove that dimensionality factor with the cost of an alpha. That's more or less the, the approach. So yeah, it depends on the channel uh, quite a lot. Yes, because if even rho and sigma are similar, they could have like very different distances after that. So, thank you very much again.